Welcome to Your Mac Life for Wednesday, June 16th, 2016, show number 1096. I am your host, Sean King. Thank you guys very much for joining me, whether you're tuning into the archive or you're one of the cool kids listening in live, 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 live. As always, we encourage you, if you're listening, if you are listening in live, to join us in our IRC chat room. Thanks for a good friend, Monty, right there on the front page of the YourMacLifeShow.com website, right below the video of my happy, smiling face. You can see the link to join us in the IRC chat room, or if you'd like something a little more full feature, a little more fun, you can also find the link to the Telegram room. We have a Telegram chat room that's open 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can uh, join us anytime you'd like there. Uh, for example, today, Sherry was showing us pictures of her new pet. She's a foster mom now of a mouse, a field mouse, a little mouse that sort of wandered into her house or something. I don't know. I don't know. It's a mouse. It's a rodent. It's a vermin-encrusted creature. <laughs> I've been teasing Sherry about it all day long. <laughs> yeah, good for you, Sherry, taking care of a mouse. He's an orphan, she says. You don't know he's an orphan? You don't know his parents? Don't give me that. Um, on tonight's show, we won't have our good friend Jim Downpool of the Loop at loopinsight.com. Poor Jim isn't feeling well. Uh, not because of the, 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 the beard bash last night, which I heard was a huge success, but because he uh, apparently him and his son uh, got a little touch of food poisoning. So hopefully he's back at the hotel just chilling and relaxing with a Heineken in hand. Uh, but he won't be on the show. And therefore, it's going to be a shorter show because I got a half hour to fill of just me talking, and that's not interesting. But we'll find some stuff to talk about. And in our starting point photography segment, thanks to our good friend Rick Madison. Rick is, I think Rick's from the uh, uh, Limug. Pretty sure he's Lime Limug? Rick Limug? I think so. Anyway, uh, Rick sent me in a picture for the photo critique segment of the starting point, photog starting point photography segment of the show. It's a great shot of the Blue Angels, the uh, demonstration flight team, uh, U.S. Navy. Blue Angels or Navy? Yeah, Blue Angels or Navy. Um, love the Blue Angels. And I prefer, personally, the Canadian Snowbirds. That's just because I'm Canadian. But Blue Angels are fun to watch, too. He took a great shot. And we're going to do that in our critique segment for starting point photography. Kind of interesting. We were talking, uh, we've been talking in the IRC chat room now for the last uh, five, ten minutes about Macworld Expos and um, our memories of the Expos. And for the most part, most of us have wonderful memories of the Expos. And a lot of those memories, I've been thinking about this a lot recently, a lot of those memories are based on people. They're not ma based on keynotes and product launches and, and, and stuff like that. It's the people that, personally, for me, I miss the most of not having Macworld Expos anymore. It's a shame that the shows, for any number of reasons, um, died. No matter what IDG, IDG says, IDG still says the show's on a hiatus. It's not on a hiatus. It's dead. It's dead and gone, buried, never to come back ever again. There's an argument being made that we don't need Macworld Expos anymore. Apple is now the most valuable company in the world. Millions upon millions upon millions of Mac users. Billions of iPhone devices, iOS devices, are out in the wild. Macworld Expos were, I think at their height, a way for a small, close-knit community to band together as a tribe to gather in one place and reaffirm their love, affection, desire for their Macintoshes and the products. But it was always about community for me. It was always about the, the people. I was rarely excited about the products. I was always more excited about the people that we got to hang out with, both famous people and listeners, I got to hang out with John Delancey, Q from Star Trek. Um, I got to hang out with and interview uh, Robin Williams and Herbie Hancock and Steven Tyler and Muhammad Ali. Uh, Sinbad became a friend of mine. But then there was all the listeners for Your Mac Life that we got to meet over the years. It was fantastic. Um it was always a show that we tried to push the envelope at. We were the first show to ever do recording from the show floor. We were the first show to ever do live audio from the show floor, live video from the show floor. 
A lot of your Mac Life's firsts, or at least Sean King's firsts, were at Macworld Expo. And I was very proud of the fact that uh, we made a lot of uh, good friends and good contacts at Macworld Expos. They're never coming back, though. I, don't, I, I, I can't see there's any way that any company would bring them back. And it's really an odd kind of thing because Apple is more popular than ever. They're bigger than ever. There are more users than ever. So you'd think that that could be a show that would, that would be a success. It's not. It's not going to be. Those of you who have been listening to me for years know that I've always thought about, I'd love to be able to do my own conference. The Your Mac Life Unconference, I've called it. But I realized, too, that it's it would less be a conference than it would be just a bunch of folks getting together to have fun. Just to, and I don't mean have fun, just drinking, there'd be plenty of that, but just to enjoy each other's company. People that I talk to on Twitter all day long, people I talk to on email, on the phone, that kind of stuff, seeing them face-to-face, having a beer with them, having dinner with them, having a party with them. Uh, I miss that stuff, especially because my life pretty much is here. I don't get out of the house very often. I certainly don't meet very many people. So it, it, for me personally, selfishly, it would be great to be able to go someplace and, and meet like-minded people. With the Apple stores, I don't need a show to with, – sorry, with the Internet and Apple, and Apple stores, I don't need a show to show me the latest, greatest thing anymore. Us old-timers remember the days of going into a Best Buy or Future Shop and seeing you know, 10 Macintosh titles on a little corner of the software section. And you'd be lucky if you found a Mac Battle peripheral. Now we have entire shows, stores dedicated to Apple. A lot of them, too. We always did. We always had the Apple retailers. But the average person never saw that kind of stuff. We don't need the shows for new product launches or things like that. I don't know. I don't know that we need the shows for community anymore either. I think the community aspect of a Macworld Expo is no longer necessary. I think part of the community was the idea that we were a beleaguered group of people. We were beset on all sides by the Windows world, the PC world. We were ignored. Our company's IT departments wouldn't let us use Macintoshes. Um, There certainly were no phones we could use that were dedicated to the Mac. So we sort of grouped together as a way of defending ourselves against the big, bad outside world. We don't need that anymore. We're not the underdog anymore. Not by a long shot. I wouldn't say we were the overdog, but certainly the Macintosh community is no longer the underdog it used to be. And maybe that under- underdog status is what drove a Macworld Expo, or drove attendance to a Macworld Expo. Binky says, oh, no, you absolutely need face-to-face for a community. Oh, I agree. I absolutely agree. You, I, I don't think I, – we hear about it all the time, but the online communities, eh, you can call them that, but I don't think of them as being communities. Online spaces, online areas, online forums, yes. But I think a community re- almost requires a face-to-face aspect to it, to be a real community. Just my opinion. Uh, can you have enough of that for a large expo? That's the hard part, says Binky. <clears throat> yeah, I don't think so anymore. I don't, I, I, I don't. My argument that Macworld Expo failed not because of the community, but because of IDG has always been unpopular. But I could never understand how IDG, with a base population around the Moscone, the old thing was 100, within 100 miles of the Moscone Center were 75% of the people who came to Macworld Expo. It wasn't truly an international show, except for the fact there were some folks, but it was mostly a regional show. And somehow IDG could not get in that 5 million people in that general area, couldn't get more than 15,000 people to show up there towards the end. I think there was more than 15,000 Mac community members out of those 5 million. I firmly believe that. So IDG 
had an inability to reach those people for whatever reasons it might be. But it's a shame. And there's no doubt I'll always miss. Um, I met people there that I'm still friends with. Binky. Um, we, we, uh, Lesh. Um, a bunch of folks that I met there and still, shit, 20 years later, almost 20 years later, still communicate with. IDG was often very weird. IDG thinking that a drum circle as an event didn't help any. Yeah. IDG's ideas for Expo just got really loopy. And in some ways drove people away instead of bringing them in. I think part of the problem is that the, the grown-ups at IDG didn't want to spend any money. And once Apple left, once I always described Apple as the black hole of Mac World Expos, it sucked everything in. And once Apple left, IDG had to do something to replace the black hole, and they didn't. I believe that they needed to spend a lot of money, and they weren't willing to do that or able to do it, whichever, whichever way. Um, they were trying to work around the lack of Apple, Binky says. That was a big problem. IDG management could be very parsimonious. But make no mistake about it, and I... I know I've been accused by him and others. I don't believe it was directly the fault of personally Paul Kent or the amazing staff he had working for him. Uh, Kathy Moran and Sarah Hindmarsh and all the other pe people that we uh, dealt with on a daily basis at a Mac World Expo. Those guys worked their asses off trying to do the best they could with what little they were given. Um, and the criticism hurt them personally. I know this for a fact because Paul Kent was – Still, he pissed off at me for some of the criticism I leveled at Macro Expo. It was never personal criticism, but Paul took it that way at, at times. It's a shame, though. I, I, I'd still love to go to a conference of fellow Mac users that wasn't focused. And there are, there are, all, are all kinds, but they're mostly, for lack of a better way of describing it, geek-related. There's Mac Tech conferences. There's coder conferences. There's WWDC. They're mostly the idea of, for lack of a better way of describing it, working conferences as opposed to, hey, let's just get together because we all use the same computer. We all do different things on it. Let's just get together and hang out. So, small conferences did okay. Mac IT had good attendance this last two years but couldn't pull in the profits IDG needed from a show. Yeah, absolutely. It just, IDG had a certain level of expectation of, of profit, which is fair. But in my opinion, they didn't do enough to generate that profit. They were hoping it would come in just through osmosis because that's what happened with Apple. IDG didn't have to do anything when Apple was at the show. They just opened the doors up and money came flooding in when Apple's at the show. And so when Apple left, they didn't seem to know what to do. Anyway, let's move on. Um, I saw I read an interesting uh, piece today uh, about the Apple Echo. Not there's no such thing, but a lot of folks before WWDC. And by the way, anyone who thought there was going to be hardware at WWDC, come on, folks, it's not a hardware show. Yes, Apple has done on occasion hardware at WWDC. It's the exception that proves the rule. It's a software show. Okay, so. Next year, don't listen to any rumors about hardware at, Ma at WWDC. If it happens, be happy about it. If it doesn't, don't write articles about how Apple's failed you. One of the problems I have with a lot of the discussion with regards to the uh, Amazon Echo is you see this, n this number thrown around a lot. Amazon will sell 4 million Echoes in 2016. You're not going to know that. Apple, Amazon isn't going to announce that number. If Amazon has never announced Kindle numbers, and they've been on sale for seven years, eight years, Amazon sure as hell isn't going to announce Echo numbers. So, first of all. But people seem to think that Apple needs to bring out their own Echo. And the counter-argument is Apple has their own Echo. It's called an iPhone. It's called Siri on the iPhone. But somebody made an interesting point that the Echo is liable to be used more because it's a physical object that's sitting 
on your kitchen table or on your counter. It's something you can see, a little blue ring around it. So you'll, you're liable to use it more because you can see it right there. I don't know if that's true. It's an interesting idea. Um, I think pr the problem I have with the Echo is that I just don't use Siri enough. I'm not a heavy Siri user. As we've said before in the show when we talked to Jim Downerpool, I use Siri for um, knowing when the basketball game is going is to come on or football or you know, when the sports ball game is going to come on and to add things to my grocery list. That's pretty much all I ever use Siri for. Timers. I set timers for, for cooking. Siri, set a 15-minute timer. I don't use Siri for looking things up on the web. I don't use Siri, hey Siri, call so-and-so. Hey Siri, text message so-and-so. It's not, not because I don't like Siri. It's because I'm generally sitting in front of this big 27-inch screen that can do all those things. And now we saw at WWDC, Apple announced that Siri is coming to the Macintosh. I don't know if that means I'll use Siri anymore. I doubt it. So for me, the Amazon Echo <clears throat> isn't really on my radar. Do you have an Echo? Do you find you use it a lot, or is it just another gadget in your home? I'd be curious to know from your Mac Life listeners. Send me emails to onair at yourmaclifeshow.com. Let me know how you guys use Siri, and do you think Apple needs its own version of the Echo? Sorry, let me know how you use the, the Echo. And do you think the Apple needs its own version of an Echo? Binky says, I see Siri and the Mac being really handy for people with physical limitations. Sure, yeah. But that's a very small subset of folks. Uh, Don H. in the Telegram Room says, uh, Use Siri, my grandson, ask his iPad things. That's a voice interface. I think that's part of it, too, is the, the, the younger you are, like most technology, the younger you are, the more accepting you are of it. And maybe the cooler you think it is. Maybe Don's grandson thinks that talking to his iPad is kind of a a cool thing to do. One of the things that we saw on, on, um, at WW, uh, no, I mean, let me do this in order. The other big rumor that didn't come true, which I didn't think was going to come true, was iMessage on Android. The iMessage on Android thing never struck me as something Apple would do because iMessage is an iPhone thing, an iOS thing. And if you really like iMessage, wouldn't you buy an iPhone? Are Android users really jonesing for iMessage when they've got their own versions of text apps? When there's Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp and WeChat and, and just straight up text messaging. I can't see that being such a big deal for Apple that they would take one of their, if not now, but soon to be crown jewels and move it over to the competing operating system. Because everyone's talking about how Apple has to get into uh, augmented reality and virtual reality and, and artificial intelligence and all this kind of stuff. I think Siri would be the platform, certainly, for a lot of AI stuff for Apple. And that being the case, wouldn't they want to keep... Remember, Apple is a software and a hardware company. And one of the reasons why this is so successful is because their hardware and software work together so well. Why would you break off some of the software that is going to be the basis of your f a future platform and put it on Android? And there might be a reason for it. I just don't see it. I don't see how people on Android, when they text someone on an iPhone, they don't know. It doesn't show up as a blue or green bubble like it does on, on iMessage. I just don't see it as being a, a, a big deal. And it was neat to, see, to hear that... Um, Walt Mossberg agrees with me. Mossberg said, uh, when I asked a senior Apple executive why iMessage wasn't being expanded to other platforms, he gave two answers, Mossberg reports. 
First, he said, Apple considers its own user base of 1 billion active devices to provide a large enough data set for any possible AI learning. And second, having a superior messaging platform that only worked on Apple devices would help sales of those devices. The company's classic and successful rationale now for years. Yeah. And yeah, there are instances of Apple having some of their software available on other platforms, iTunes on Windows being a prime example of it. But uh, Monty says, iMessage on Android would allow text message communication with Android phone users without a hit on your carrier SMS text message service and, in theory, provide end-to-end -end encryption. Yeah, but Apple doesn't care about that. Apple, I think in their heart of hearts, doesn't want end-to-end -end encryption on Android devices. Because that's one of Apple's selling points. Hey, that thing over there is insecure. Our thing over here is secure. Use our thing. So I don't think that could be a, a possible logic from Apple's point of view to make things more secure on Android. Apple can't even read your messages. Google never makes that promise for messages on Android. I can assume that most, if not all of you, have watched WWDC, watched the keynote. Wonderful opening by Tim Cook, um, showing respect for the victims of the awful tragedy in Orlando, Florida over the weekend. And we echo those. I haven't said anything about it because there's nothing I can say. My opinions are either well-known or easily divined. I'm Canadian. <clears throat> There's literally nothing left that anybody can say about this stuff anymore. What What is needed now is action. Do something. As everyone said on, on Twitter, prayers ain't working. Who's ever getting those prayers ain't listening. Uh, Trevor Noah on Daily Show said something really interesting on Monday night. America has to decide if this is the nation they want to be. A nation where this is not only normal, but acceptable. Marco Rubio said something that just literally made me almost cry. He said, it was Florida's turn. Please, America, don't take turns with this. This is not something you want to take turns at. It's not, a, it's not Florida's turn. It's not anybody's turn. Anyway, so Cook's very heartfelt. I don't know if you saw it in the video, but he actually was wiping away tears during the moment of silence. The interesting thing about WWDC in a big picture kind of way was did you notice that Cook bookended it? He came on and introduced. He came on and ended. He wasn't seen in the middle. I thought that was very, very interesting. If only because it shows that Tim Cook not isn't the showman of Steve Jobs. I think Tim Cook doesn't need to be the showman of Steve Jobs. Tim Cook knows where his strengths are. And while he's perfectly he's a perfectly engaging speaker, I love his accent, he know he doesn't need to be the guy to show you to show you all this stuff. And I'm okay with that. As I've all, always said, I, I care less about who's presenting and more about what they're presenting. In general, I don't pay attention to the clothes the person's wearing unless it's Eddie Q and his ugly pink shirts. We all know that Silicon Valley has a diverse, diversity problem and that most presenters are going to be middle-aged white guys. We know that. So I don't pay much attention to it. I know it's a problem. I know it's going to be a problem for a long, long period of time. So I, I'm more interested in what they say and not who says that thing. As Benke says, rightly so, Federighi is entertaining enough for everyone. I would let Fred Federighi do everything. I love listening to Federighi. Schiller and Q both kind of rub me the wrong way because they feel like marketing guys. Um, I know Phil Schiller, I wouldn't say personally, but I've spoken to him, and I, it's funny, his in-person one-on-one personality is different from that marketing guy I see on stage. 
never met Eddie Q, but I assume Eddie Q is probably the same way that there's a marketing guy on stage and a hopefully different guy one to one. Um, so I don't much care about who's presenting. I'm more I more care about how they present. And the interesting thing is, I said this on Twitter, and only slightly jokingly, that the the Apple keynotes the way they are run now is subtly different from the way Steve Jobs did them. There's a lot of folks that don't seem to be as prepared as they were in the Jobs era. And that's not a bad thing. Public speaking is a hard thing to do. It's not for everyone. As I've often said, just because you have a voice doesn't mean you know how to use it. So a lot of these folks are going to be nervous. They're, 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 maybe they don't have experience public speaking and they just don't like it. It's the always described as one of the top three fears people have behind death and divorce so i get when people are nervous public speaking but they're certainly not as polished as people were when jobs was doing because jobs made them practice he made them obsessively know their material you can see people now are reading off of the screens that are at the foot of the stage where you rarely saw that beforehand because jobs drill into these folks you should be able to do this speech without looking at prompts but that's okay. That's okay. I'm I'm okay with that. And even some of the awkwardness, the the folks who were uh, doing the iMessage thing, that was awkward and forced. Eh. Sherry points out. Uh, what about Bozma? Bozma St. John. <laughs> the reaction to Bozma St. John is hilarious. Utterly hilarious. A lot of the tone is. A lot of the undercurrent is she scares us. You know. <laughs> Who's the scary black lady? <laughs> people just freaked out. Now, I didn't because Bozema is my people. To me, seeing a black woman is not unusual. All right? <laughs> so for me, it wasn't that big a deal. The funniest thing had to be, though, when she put on Rapper's Delight and she said to the, the crowd, y'all know this beat? I was like, no, sweetie, they don't. <laughs> That's the wrong crowd. <laughs> this is a bunch of nerds. <laughs> Primarily white nerds, primarily male white nerds, probably fairly young, even middle aged. They probably don't get rappers delight. <laughs> Plus, it was like eleven o'clock in the morning. <laughs> now she was great. I loved her. She was seemed out of place with her energy, with her vibe, but I loved it. That was great. But a lot of the subtext I read online. Is yeah, you know, people are people are intimidated by her, which is you know their issue and not hers. She's who she is, and who she is is great. So if anyone's got issues with Bozma, that's your problem. Dave D said, "I never saw so many uncomfortable devs." <laughs> Other than getting pasty white nerds a rap, wasn't feeling that too much. Yeah, and you weren't feeling it because it wasn't the right venue for Bozma's vibe. If that had been a, a music event, that would have gone over great. But it wasn't. It was a it was a developer conference. So. But I liked her. I thought she was fun. The other thing, uh, 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 we were talking about this in the pre-show, uh, uh, the idiot Don Resinger. First of all, he complained that the, that Apple was using the keynote just for their own stuff. That there were no third-party developers. But then he complained about third-party developer demonstrations. He's like, dude, make up your freaking mind. Now, what happens with these third-party folks is Apple will pick a company and like six months ago, three months ago, hey, we've got this new thing coming up in the next version of the operating system. We think your company would be a good fit can you have something ready in six months or three months? And that company, of course, will always go, yes. So maybe they didn't find anybody who fit. That's why there were no third-party demos. No big deal. It didn't hurt anything. It didn't make any bit of difference. So don't bitch about the fact there were no third-party demos. It felt rushed, but not uh, harried. I don't know if that makes any sense. Last year, uh, WWDC felt very 
eh, it wasn't it didn't feel like it was put together very well. This one seemed like they were doing a lot of stuff in a very short period of time. They were reaming off feature sets of things. They were doing things very, very quickly. They had so much they wanted to get across. But it didn't feel like it was um, uh, poorly done. So I, so I enjoyed WWDC. Um, and some folks, as always, said it was boring. I didn't find it boring. I thought it was very, very interesting. I thought the next version of the Mac OS is going to be very interesting. The next version of iOS is going to be very interesting. The, best, the next version of watchOS. WatchOS, I don't have an Apple Watch, as you can see. From what I've t the people I've talked to and the things I've read about watchOS, there are a lot of really neat things in there for those folks who have an Apple Watch. Speed, if nothing else, is a big deal for uh, folks who, who use the Apple Watch. And they showed that in the demonstration. That was one of the things that the Apple recognized that people complained about was that the previous versions of WatchOS were very slow in launching apps and that kind of stuff. So, so they've done things like that to fix that. I don't know whether or not watch this version of WatchOS will be enough to get me and others to buy an Apple Watch. Would it you? Would it you? <laughs> Would you? From seeing the demos and reading whatever you read, does watch the new Watch OS make you more likely to buy the next version of the Apple Watch? I don't know. For me, the biggest thing is price and functionality. Up here in Canada, the Apple Watch is about 800 bucks, And because it doesn't do anything for me above and beyond things I, I've already got, I can't justify spending that kind of money on a watch. I know lots of folks who love their Apple Watch. Uh, but for me, just because of my lifestyle and because of my needs, the Apple Watch remains a would like to have as opposed to a need. I need an iPhone. I need an iMac. I don't need an Apple Watch. Monty says this version of WatchOS and presentation feels like what the first version should have been. Yeah, but you can say that for everything. That's true. That's true of everything. The problem I have with that statement is I've seen this a lot in the last couple of days. Um, who's this from? This is from uh, The Verge. So take it with a grain of salt. WatchOS 3's admission that Apple's first attempt was all wrong. And Jason Snell at Six Colors had something similar to this. I would disagree with that strongly. I don't think it's admission that the first version was wrong. And maybe it's just a way of looking at things. But I think of it as being Apple listening to the customers. Apple putting out the watch, listening to what people say, and then making changes to the operating system to, just, to, to, to satisfy those comments, speed being one of them. I don't think that Apple Watch version 1 was bad or wrong. Again, I don't own one, so I don't know. I, I've never experienced the Apple Watch. So I can't say for certain that the first version was a mistake or wrong. But if you have a different opinion, let me know. On air at yourmaclifeshow.com. I'd love to hear from you guys if you think that I'm wrong. They got to the announcements for... Uh, WWDC fairly quickly. There's a lot of things as always. And remember, keep in mind, WWDC is for programmers. It's not for you and I as the customers. The things they're announcing is are things that they want the coders and developers in the room to get excited about and then go and create things for. So Apple did make a lot of announcements at the show. Uh, some of the things that they they announced that wasn't even uh, there weren't even things that were uh, obvious. Uh, a lot of stuff that they just threw up on screens behind them because they didn't have time to get to everything. The next version of the Mac OS and wasn't it funny that everyone seemed to just get so excited over the name change from OS X to Mac OS? Who cares? That's what it was called before OS X. <laughs> 
And as Binky and I, both a couple old timers, said, I just don't like the no, no space between Mac and OS. It kind of annoys me. And I don't like the non capitalized Mac. That just kind of annoys me too. But you know what? It doesn't matter. We're going to forget all about it in six months. Um, but there's a lot of good things in there. A lot of good things that uh, Federighi showed off. Some fun stuff. As I said earlier, I don't know if Siri and the Macintosh is going to be a big deal to me. Uh, one of the things that people seemed to be really excited about was was picture in picture on the Mac OS. I don't care about that. Because for me, video is to be watched. It's not a, a, a secondary thing on my screen. If I have video, I generally have it full screens. I want to see the video. I don't watch the video. But a lot of folks are excited about that kind of stuff. Um, all kinds of things about tabs, and there's a bunch of stuff with regards to the Mac OS, Sierra, as it will be called. Stability, I don't have much of a problem with. I have a problem with my machine slowing down over time. I have to reboot it once every three or four days because the machine sort of seems to bog down. Uh, some of the things that were told later, uh, Safari will automatically... Uh, Safari will block plugins unless absolutely necessary. Right now, this is a weird thing where um, <clears throat> some websites and some uh, uh, services will, even if they have an, uh, uh, an alternative, will still show, try to show you Flash content instead of defaulting to HTML5. Well, now what Safari is going to do is completely block Flash content and just tell that website, no, 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 I'm HTML5. Unless it's absolutely necessary that Flash be turned on. So at Flash will be turned on and off as um, as needed, which is a good thing. Because Flash should be off all the time. Um, iOS 10, a lot of things in iOS 10. The 3D touch stuff, I don't know anything about because I don't have a 3D touch capable phone. Um, the lock screen stuff was interesting. Everyone seemed to be excited about the, the, the lift to activate. I don't care. It's not that hard to push a button for me. Um, oh, the iMessage emoji things. He shall remain nameless, but he know what it, knows who, who he is. Myself and someone else were iMessaging back and forth today. He was like, this is just going to be the most annoying thing in the world. But maybe it's just because we're old farts. You know, I'm, I don't use emojis. I use a happy, happy face and a frowny face. That's it. So this is I'm not the market for these kinds of big uh, 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 emojis or fireworks or all that kind of stuff. It's cutesy to me. It's, I think designed for a different market than us older guys. But the thing is, we don't have to use it. You know, it's not being forced on us to use these kinds of gratuitous graphics. If I know someone who does a lot of those things, I'll ask them to stop doing it. No big deal. Or tell them I can't read the graphic or the emoji. Not that big a deal. It's cute, but it's not the I'm, I'm, I'm ever going to use. The problem is, and I saw this on Twitter today, and this is where the problem is is, is going to come from. Look at this. Um, where's my? Uh, I showed the wrong screen. Why are you showing the wrong screen? Oh, god damn it! Hang on, hang on. Oh, Every now and then, my. <sighs> my um, Wirecast just feels the need to decide it doesn't want to remember my settings from a previous session. And that's what's happening here now. So hang on a second while I get this stupid thing to come back to life. There we go. So here's a, a, a tweet I saw yesterday. 
from somebody named Adam Bain. We just launched new emoji something to reach something tweeting ABT uh, pizza taco etc. Marketers don't sleep on it. It's Armstrong. Plug it in. You'll lo- it just oh my god, oh my god. I would unfollow someone who did that on a regular basis. I have no interest in trying to parse out your tweets in that way, your text in that way. I want to be able to read it and understand it instantly, not try to figure out, well, what does that emoji mean? No, no interest in that kind of stuff at all. And I will unfollow folks who tweet like that. That would just, yeah, Carrie Fisher, exactly. Uh, Binky says, you should you should uh, see Carrie Fisher. She emojis like some kind of emoji grandmaster, which is why I don't follow Carrie Fisher. I think Carrie Fisher is one of the coolest women on the planet. But I refuse to follow her on Twitter because she just annoys the shit out of me with all those emojis. <laughs> just just makes me nuts with all all those things. So, yeah, I, I, I have no interest in uh, in following her. Oh, that I knew there was something else about Mac OS X that I thought was going to be interesting. This idea of having your desktop everywhere. And it's kind of funny because, again, us old-timers are like, no! We spent years telling people to not put everything on their desktop. And now Apple is telling us, put everything on your desktop. Now, I don't know how that's going to work. In the past, having a lot of things on your desktop was not good. Uh, Binky says that had been a problem for like a decade. It's a problem when people don't know how to, uh uh-oh, I'm getting lens flare. Hang on. Oops. Here we go. It's a problem when users don't know how to properly um, manage their system. They just throw everything on the desktop and they can't find things. So I was always encouraging folks to to put things in proper folders, put your pictures in a picture folder, your movies in a movie folder, your documents in a document folder, as opposed to just everything on the desktop. Apple News gets a redesign. Don't care. Don't use Apple News. Apple Music gets a redesign. Do you care about that? Are you a frequent Apple Music user that you uh, care? I don't use Apple Music anymore, so I don't know about that design. Um, Maps is interesting. Maps are always um, one of those things that, that a lot of folks point out, but because I'm a motorcycle rider, Apple Maps is not particularly useful to me because it's not... Um, it doesn't have the information that a motorcycle rider needs. It's good for directions. And I've used it several times for just, you know, gen- sorry, sorry, I'm getting all kinds of lens flare. Let me move this camera. There we go. Um, it doesn't do the kinds of things I need as a, either a driver or a motorcyclist. It has certainly gotten better. There's no doubt about that. There's less mistakes. There's still mistakes, but there's certainly fewer mistakes than there were in the past. Um, it says Maps is designed with navigation in mind, but it still, as far as I can see, won't tell you your speed, for example, which is something I need to know. So you folks who drive, you have your speedometer, and then you usually have your phone somewhere else or your gps somewhere else on a motorcycle they're usually right in the way you put your gps device in front of your speedometer because you don't want it over here you're going to be looking over there for this information so i can't see my speedometer so i need to have that information on my gps Waze does it my tom tom does it google maps doesn't do it and apple maps doesn't do it Dave D. says, uh, I still use a standalone Garmin when on long trips. Another problem with maps, you can't do multiple destinations. You can't tell maps, I want to go here, then here, then there. You've got to do it as separate points, which is fine, again, if you're in a car. But on a bike, not so good. Uh, Binky says, I'm still surprised a lot of helmet HUDs haven't made it out of limited testing yet. The, the Scully is the one that's closest to being realized. But first of all, 1200 bucks on a helmet that is not 
tested yet to motorcycle riders' satisfaction. We don't know that they work 1,200 bucks. Um, the HUD stuff is interesting, but for the most part, it's not um, uh, worth it for a lot of motorcyclists yet. It might be in, in the future. Um, photos is going to be really cool. Uh, the new uh, ability for photos to parse data. I don't use the Photos app, but um, you, if you do, you have some a lot of really cool features in there. One of the big things that, um, you know, Dave D, twelve hundred bucks for on a helmet that's supposed to break? Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, Binky says it ain't like helmets are cheap. Well, helmets are cheap. You can buy a hundred dollar helmet. The problem with those hundred dollar helmets is, as I always tell folks, what's your brain worth? Um, a hundred dollar helmet is a helmet that may not be as protective as a four hundred dollar helmet, as a eight hundred dollar helmet. I, you know, you, I, I, I ride wearing an eight hundred dollar helmet, uh, a showy. Right? I've, I've got an Arai too. Those are both very expensive helmets, but they're also generally considered to be the most protective helmets. They're also incredibly light. That hundred dollar helmet. You think you're saving seven hundred bucks? Well, maybe you are. But that hundred dollar helmet's going to be two or three pounds heavier than the Araya the Showy. And maybe if you're only riding for half an hour, it's no big deal. But if you're like me and you'll go riding for eight hours in a day, ten hours in a day, having to hold up that extra pound, pound and a half in your, on, on, on your shoulders and your neck can can uh, be exhausting after a while. Um I actually watched my first WWDC developer session today about um, iOS photo capture. And it was because a little birdie at Apple told me I should watch this. Well, it turns out that Apple is going to allow raw capture on iOS devices in iOS 10. Now, to be clear, all cameras capture in RAW. They all take pictures with RAW. They output to JPEG. Your iPhone outputs to JPEG, and a lot of other uh, phones output to, to JPEG. RAW is a, I've always, the, the guy in the video used this, a similar analogy. RAW is the, the, if you're making chocolate chip cookies, RAW is the cookie dough and the chips and the egg and the flour and the, that kind of stuff, the butter. JPEG is the, is the baked cookie. You can't do many changes to the baked cookie. Also, file, small, file sizes on JPEGs are much, much smaller. So Apple's going to allow um, iOS devices to capture in RAW and only uh, the, the, the most recent iPhones and allow RAW editing. And that's where, a big, that's where something that's very, very interesting is, 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 is going to happen. You're going to be able to edit RAW files. And the advantage of editing RAW files on your iOS device, whether it be your iPad or your iPhone, is the RAW files are significantly bigger than a JPEG file. But the reason why they're bigger is because they have more data. They have a bigger color space than a JPEG file does, so you can do more things to it. For example, if you've ever taken a picture in uh, fluorescent lighting, and like the video right now, it's, it's got a blue tone to it. Well, if you take an iPhone shot, you can't change that blue tone. If you take a raw shot, that blue tone's the, the white balance. If you take a raw shot, you can mess with the white balance. If you over or underexpose a shot with a JPEG, you can't do a whole lot about the over or underexposed parts of it. With a raw file, you can make changes and, and regain some of the data, some of the picture that's in that over or underexposed area. So raw is going to be good. It's going to be a pain because the file sizes are significantly larger than JPEGs, anywhere from 5 to 10%, no, sorry, 5 to 10 times larger than the equivalent JPEG. And if you don't want to edit your shots, don't worry about it, because as I saw in the video, you can turn the RAW on and off. So what it means is that a lot of developers are going to change the Lightroom and Pixelmator and Acorn and the other guys who have iOS apps will have to, not have to, but will likely change their software to allow you to edit in RAW. Um, voicemail transcription, eh, 
I've had it on on Google Voice for years now, so it'll be nice to have. But I don't think it's all it's going to be that important. Um, the The best part about it for me was as as always the next day talking to developers, emailing them, and talking to them on the phone, and hearing about whether they were excited about what's going to happen for their apps and the direction they heard from Apple. And for the most part, they all were very excited. That's the reason behind the WWDC, is to excite developers, is to make them want to run back to their hotel room, download the developer b previews, and start playing with the stuff. And speaking of which, unless you are a developer, don't install the public betas or the previews. They're unstable. They're not designed to be put on your everyday. We say this every goddamn time. And I'm already seeing folks complain about this stuff. We see these people all the time download these public betas or, or, or developer previews, and something breaks because something's always going to break. And they whine about it on Twitter and on Reddit and on the developer's website and on their, their iTunes page. Oh, this, this app broke. Well, what OS are you using? The developer preview. Of course it broke. The developer's still in San Francisco. He's had a chance to fix whatever Apple's changed. Don't bitch about software breaking in a developer preview or public beta. Don't You know what? Unless you know what you're doing, don't even download the public beta. It'll be available in July. Just don't. You don't need to unless you are coding, unless there's some reason for your job you need to use the public beta, don't use it. It's just going to be an exercise in frustration for the most part, both for you and for developers. Because now they're going to put up these little fires that these kids set on Twitter and Facebook and iTunes. This doesn't work, this doesn't work, doesn't work. I think the weirdest segment of WWDC, and literally as I'm watching it, I went, what the hell? Was was it Federighi? I can't remember who it was, but one of the one of the the Apple executives read out a quote from Deepak Chopra that br the Breathe app. Now the Breathe app is kind of interesting. A lot of folks could use that sort of what they what are called mindfulness apps, just reminders to stand up, to calm down, to take deep breaths. Those are not bad things. But Deepak Chopra, for the most part, has been fairly discredited, I think, or I thought anyway, that it's a little new agey for Apple. So to have him be quoted on the, on the stage was sort of like, ooh, that was kind of odd. Kind of struck me as a strange thing for, for Apple to say. Just going through the list of uh, things that Apple announced. Uh, TVOS, eh. Can't see that being a whole, whole lot of things. Um, here's that column from Don Ressinger. All the things we didn't get from Apple's keynote. And again, he's listening to the rumors, internalizing the rumors, believing the rumors, and then being pissy at Apple for not delivering on the rumors. Instead of being pissy at the rumor sites, iMessage and Android being one. The fact that there weren't any, any hardware, wasn't any hardware announced at WWDC. I think, without a doubt, the, the, yeah, Binky. Oh, my God, why are you quoting that moron? Yeah, it was, it was a very strange thing for Apple to be quoting. Um, I think the coolest thing I saw at the WWDC key keynote, and I would not have expected this to be the coolest thing that I saw, was Swift Playground. The, the, that coding environment for kids and dumb adults like me, I have no idea what the end result of Swift, of Swift Playground is going to be. Is it just a teaching tool? Is it, it will it, will there be an app come out the other end of it? Will you be, can you create an app using Swift Playground? Or is it just a tutorial on coding? Regardless, I'm going to play with it. It looked really neat. 
it looked like a lot of fun, and it looked like an interesting way to introduce people to coding. Now, Steve, uh, Tim Cook said it, and I hate when he says it, when he says that coding should be taught in schools. Every child should learn how to code. No, I disagree vehemently with that. No, not every child needs to learn how to code. That's the same logic as saying every child needs to learn how to dunk a basketball. Because at some point in the future, they may play, play in the NBA. No, no, don't teach every child to code. The ones who are interested in coding, yes, please, by God, teach them how to code. But it also comes from a place of privilege where Tim Cook, he's grown up and been in an environment where that's a possibility, that schools would have the tools to teach kids how to code. Not every school has computers or iPads or teachers who know how to teach this stuff. That's the other thing people keep forgetting about this. Every kid should learn how to code. Well, every kid needs to learn how to code. Who's going to teach them? Because teachers don't know how to code. Dave D says, Sean, every child should understand what the hell code is, not necessarily how to do it. Uh, Dave D, just like everyone should understand civics. Well, yes, you should definitely understand civics. <laughs> uh, Binky says, it's not just the teaching tool. It's a huge chunk of the full dev frameworks in that. Interesting. And Binky says, they don't need a dunk. They need a three-point game. The way the NBA is going nowadays, you're right. Teach every kid how to shoot a three-pointer. <laughs> Yeah, I I never had computers when I was a kid. I don't think every kid needs to learn how to code because not every kid has an interest in coding. It's just like I, I've always said this, that in grade 11 or 12, stop teaching calculus or algebra. I've never had to solve for X in my entire adult freaking life. Make that stuff elective. I have no problem with coding being elective for those kids who are interested in it. That's great. Good for them. But not every kid wants to learn how to code, can learn how to code, and not every school district can afford to teach teachers how to code. I think you're setting up, setting up expectations that are all wrong in this. But like I said, I think Swift Playground is very cool, and I'm really dying to get my hands on it and see what I can do as an adult. Um, I know I can't code. I know I'm just I'm watching the uh, WWDC uh, session on um, photo capture. There was nothing I could, I could comprehend when he was talking about the coding aspects of it. And that's probably because he's jumping in, you know, way upstream of what I'm capable of. But, yeah, I'm looking at it my eyes are just glazing over. Binky says, there's no way an average K-12 district can have a set of good programming teachers in the labs and gears that require it. That's just a cruel joke. Exactly. You're setting yourself up, setting people up for expectations that can't be met by 60%, 75% of the school districts in North America, if not more. That's why I say that Cook is speaking from the point of view of privilege, that he's grown up in environments and areas where schools can't afford that kind of stuff. But most of us didn't and don't. Just going through the stories that I had picked out for us to talk about. I think it's it. Let me. What are your thoughts and opinions on WWDC, uh, on what was announced, on um, what you think is going to be interesting going forward? Keeping in mind, again, that WWDC is targeted at specifically developers that don't bitch about the lack of hardware. Yes, I know it's overdue. The Mac Pro hasn't been updated since 2013, and that's just a crying shame, but Apple kind of ignores the pro nowadays. I 
If someone offered me a bet, 100 bucks, of whether or not a Mac Pro would be announced this year, I'd say no. I think MacBook Pros will, will, will be announced, but even those won't, won't be an event. They'll just be a press release. I think we'll see new laptops this year. I don't think we'll see new new desktops, new towers. Apple just doesn't have a lot of interest, seemingly, in that end of the market anymore for whatever reason. In our starting point photography segment, as always, I, if you guys want to play with this, if you want to participate in this, please send me a photo uh, that you would like me to critique in a positive, life-affirming kind of way. Um, don't know what the photo is. It could be of your kids or, or whatever. If you want to find out, this is how you get better at photography. Because the problem is you can't ask your significant other, oh, that's a pretty picture. You can't ask your friends, nice shot. Ask someone who's going to give you an honest opinion, and that'll be me. Send an email to Sean at yourmaclifeshow.com. Once a month, we'll pick a photo out of the grab bag, and uh, we'll do a bit of a critique on the photo. So this photo comes from our good friend uh, Rick Mad- Richard Madison. It says, um, I was fortunate to be able to attend the Blue Angels practice session for the air show at Jones Beach here in New York on May 27th. Spent the better part of a day shooting many types of aircraft, my new Sigma 150 600 millimeter lens on a Nikon D750. Over 700 images, handheld. I wanted to get your valued opinion of one particular image. I broke a fruit, yeah, I broke a few rules, almost centered and square, but I think it works in this case. So let's take a look at Rick's original photo. This is the photo as he shot it. This is right out of the camera. These are the Blue Angels. Uh, Rick is okay and preferred. Okay, I shall call him Rick. Mr. Chips in IRC chat room. Um, lovely shot. Love the silhouette, the, the, the light. Uh, you can't see that they're blue. Um, but this is the shot that Rick wanted me to critique. Can you see the difference? First of all, obviously, black and white. Secondly, square. And thirdly, he the way he cropped it, he made it, he brought the um, image closer to you. I'll, I'll go back to the, to, to the original. See how the image is far away in this one? But what he did was he cropped the top clouds and brought it down to there. What do you think? It's a good shot or not? Not a good shot. What's your opinion? Folks in the IRC chat room and the Telegram room, let me know. Good shot or not? Interesting shot or not? You like the black and white version better than the color version? Monty says, pretty. Pinky says, that's a great angle on of the... Great angle. Love the black and white. Sherry prefers the color version. Dave D says, good shot. Love the trails. Sherry, perfect angle. Yeah, the, the, that's certainly one thing that really grabs you on this one, Rick, you got a great angle on this. This was fantastic. Rick uh, is in the IRC chat room. Rick, was this just a happy accident that uh, they happened to be flying directly at you when you got this shot? The only problem I have with the black and white version of this, Rick, is because, and I'll go back to the previous color version, there's a little bit of cloud in the background, so it gives some texture. One of the problem, one of the funniest things I've learned as a photographer is a clear blue sky sometimes sucks. <laughs> sometimes you want puffy clouds because it gives some texture and some detail to your shots. So look at the, the black and white version, and you see there's nothing behind the Blue Angels. It's a, it's a flat shot because of that. Uh, something I teach in the class is uh, look for three elements in your shot. Foreground, middle ground, and background. Well, because there's no clouds in this shot, in the, in the black and white version, there's no background. It's hard to see the images 
of the plane. It, it doesn't give you a 3D image of the shot. Look at the color version. See what I'm saying? It's a little bit more in the color version. But not a, this was nothing Rick could do. This is not Rick's fault. This is not a, a, a knock on Rick as a bad photographer. That was just the circumstances of his image. There were no clouds behind him. You can't do anything about that. Uh, Mr. Chips, Rick says, no, our location was center stage. The weather didn't cooperate. The sky was flat for most of the day. Yeah, nothing you, you, you can do about that. The only thing you could do, Rick, how did you edit this, Rick? Did you edit it in um, Photoshop or Lightroom or on the phone or on the iPad? What editing software did you use? The reason why I'm asking is that maybe, depending on the editing software, you could uh, get more high contrast Lightroom. Okay. Rick, open the photo up again in Lightroom and see what kind of um, Lightroom black and white presets. There's a bunch already there. There's a bunch of free ones available on, on, on the Internet. See if there's some sort of um, grainy contrasty kind of preset you could use to maybe give some detail to the background. Give that a try. Again, angle, perfect, beautiful angle. Um, the the contrails, the, the uh, uh, what are those coming, smoke trails coming out of the jets, fantastic. I think you could probably, depending on your knowledge of planes, recognize these are the Blue Angels. So that that wouldn't be uh, that wouldn't be a detail that's get lost because it's in in black and white. And you say uh, almost centered. I don't see a problem with the centering of this because the centering for this image, Rick, is below the planes. It's just on the smoke, for the most part. So I don't think I don't think there's there's a problem with with, with, with the centering of this shot at all, with the way you cropped it to the square. Uh, Mr. Chip says, uh, I haven't tried that yet, but I bet that there isn't one that you what, that would do what you suggest. Give it a try, Rick. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised at, 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 at what some of the um, Lightroom presets can do. Just play around and see and see if see if something can happen. But you're right. There's not a whole lot you could have done with this. But your angle, the shot itself, I think your composition was fantastic. I think your crop was great. Um, like I said, the only real criticism is, is the sky. And there's nothing you can do about that. There wasn't anything you could do about the, the sky in the background. The great thing is Rick was, was also kind enough to um, knowing my love of uh, our wonderful, wonderful uh, uh, snowbirds in Canada. Uh, snowbirds are our version of a demonstration team. I think the biggest difference with the snowbirds is obviously they use different planes, but they have a lot more pilots. And there's a great snowbird shot that Rick took and another fantastic snowbird shot that rick took so yeah you got some you got some really nice shots rick so congratulations um i think i think your your um um blue angel shot i think that's printable i think that's a shot that 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 you should be very very proud of and it looks like a shot that i would i would have hanging up in a, a man cave somewhere sherry says i haven't seen the snowbirds in years i miss them i love love going to air shows I love seeing both the static displays and the, the, the noise, the roar of these jets. And the problem is the only air show we have access to, and it's true of all air shows, is the Abbotsford Air Show, and it's a freaking zoo. And it's almost always stinking stupid hot. Standing on tarmac for eight, nine hours a day is just brutal. Although I'm thinking this year they have a special – photographer's preview i might pay and go to that one's 50 bucks uh, i might go to that one this year because you get to go to the practice on friday in the evening it's a lot cooler yeah binky pay it pay it all i know <laughs> i know i'm really tempted to do it if i if i can if i can if i can gather up 50 spare bucks i'll do it but yeah i'm a big fan of air shows uh, let's see if there's any, any photography questions that you guys have sent me this week. Let me uh, get to my folder O questions. Let's see. 
Which camera would you buy, this is from Seth, which camera would you buy for clicking portraits and why? Uh, Seth, there's no such thing as a camera for portraits. It's more of a lens for portraits and a style for portraits. Uh, for the most part, any camera can take good pictures. Any camera can take good portrait pictures. It's up to you as a photographer to know how to take good portrait pictures. But you want a camera and a lens that's got a uh, relatively small number for its aperture. You're looking at f4 and below. And you're looking at a lens that's between 75 and, I want to say, 100 millimeters. Because that lets you get... You can take pictures. If you look on YouTube, you do a YouTube search for uh, portrait photographers or portrait studio shoots. You'll notice that in portrait photography, the the camera isn't right in the person's face. The photographer is often 10, 15 feet away, and they're using generally a 75 millimeter lens. You'd think it would be the other way around. You'd want to get up as close as you could to the person, but. When you get up that close and when you use a, uh, a lens that's not suited, it, it distorts the, the human face. You get bulbous noses and really wide foreheads. So portrait photographers don't get up real close to their subject. They use a lens that lets them get closer. So look for a lens that's got a small aperture number, so four or below, and 75 to 85 millimeters. Portrait photography is more about your skill not only in photography, but in lighting and in making the person whose portrait you're taking feel comfortable. That's a skill that's m more important than the camera you're using. And we're talking about uh, posed headshots. That's, that's, I think that's, in my opinion, that's an even more important skill. Um... Joanne says, I feel comfortable shooting in S and A mode. That's shutter priority and aperture priority mode. How do I now move on to fully manual, and what can I gain when I do that? Ooh, good question. Um, it depends on what you're shooting. You'll gain more creativity. You'll gain more control over light. You'll gain more um, ability to manipulate the camera to make it do what you want it to do. For example, if you listened in last week's show, I was talking about shooting waterfall shots. If I had shot those shots in just sh shutter priority or just aperture priority, they wouldn't have come out. I had to shoot them in manual. I had to have complete control over my camera. Um, I'd say shutter priority and aperture priority were like uh, a sports car that's got uh, paddle shifting. You know, you can, you can go real fast with the, with the paddle shifters. But a manual the a manual car, you, you're doing a whole lot more stuff with your feet and there's just more things that are going on. So it depends on what you're shooting. If, if, if you're finding that in shutter priority you can't get the shots you want or in aperture priority you can't get the shots that you want, then switch to manual. Uh, as a beginner, there's no need to shoot manual. You can if you want to, if you're comfortable, but you don't need to shoot manual as a beginner. Binky showing. What, what's Binky showing? Binky showing pictures? Where's Binky? Oh, nice shot of the uh, F-22 Binky. Is that what that one is? F-35. F-35. Let me show you Binky's F-35 shot. What the hell? Why is this thing fitting on? Here we go. There it is. F-35. Mr. Chip says, full manual allows you to force the camera to do different things. Exactly. It's a great way of, of describing it, Mr. Chips. <clears throat> Say, for example, um, I want to take a silhouette shot. So I've got, the, I've got the sun behind my subject, and the person is in front of my camera. What I want is uh, a nice sunset, and then the person in silhouette. Well, if I did that on auto, the camera would try to fill in the light on the person in front of me. It would try to balance out all that bright sunlight and dark face. And it would fail because it wasn't what I wanted. 
By using full manual, I'm able to tell the camera, no, 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 no. Let me control all the parameters of the shooting. And that's how I would get that, that shot would be um, by, having, by being in full manual. Trying to see anything else? Any other emails? Uh, so, yeah, thanks very much to, uh, to Rick Madison for uh, participating in our photo critique on this segment of Starting Point Photography. Um, if you want to play, please do. Send me, send me a picture. Uh, send it at the highest resolution you can. Let me, give me a little story of the, the photo. Let me know what kind of camera you shot it with, what kind of lens you shot it with. If you can, the settings that you, you shot it with, a little story of the photo. And uh, on uh, next month, in a month's time, we'll pick another photo and do our photo critique. So thanks very much to, to Rick Madison for letting me do that. I appreciate that, Rick. Folks, that's it for tonight's show. I want to say thanks to you guys, as always, for being uh, involved in the show. Uh, if you're listening to the archive, uh, what did you think about WWDC? Are you excited for watchOS or excited for the next version of iOS, version 10? Are you excited for, for the new macOS? What are, you, what are your thoughts and opinions about WWDC in general or anything in particular? Uh, I want to say thanks very much to you guys for joining us here live in the IRC chat room, in the Telegram chat room. That's always the, the most fun I have for the show is getting your guys' questions and comments live during the show. That's always the most fun. So until next week, as always, I've been Sean King, and you've been listening to Your Mac Life. See ya! See ya!